Hello and welcome to the APSCC 2021 webinar series. I'm Christopher Slaughter, your MC for the series. Uh, we're happy to have you uh, joining us today. If you're new to the series, welcome. If you're uh, joining us from last year's series, welcome back. Uh, we hope that you've registered on the APSCCSAT.com website uh, and that uh, you encourage your friends and colleagues to, to log in as well. Uh, today's topic is a, a very uh, anticipated one. Uh, it's a, a look back at what happened in 2020, some of the highlights uh, and trends of the industry uh, from the year gone by, uh, some of the highlights and some of the lowlights as well, uh, and a look forward at how, uh, how trends are shaping up for 2021, what some of the key issues and some of the key uh, technologies and trends will, will be going forward. Uh, joining us today, uh, some of our favorite people, some of the, the analysts uh, that watch the industry closely. Uh, Peter DeSelding from Space Intel Report is our moderator for today's session. Uh, he's joined by Carissa Christensen from Bryce Space and Technology, uh, as well as Pacom Revillon from Euroconsult, and Tim Farrar from TMF Associates. I uh, look forward to a very entertaining uh, and, uh, and informative, at times provocative session. Uh, take it away, Peter. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our one hour talk today with some of the industry's best known observers on what 2020 looked like, what they thought the important events of 2020 were, and how they might shape 2021. It was an eventful year. I have my own list of things I think were among the most important, but I would rather hear from our guests first, and we're going to take them in the order that I announce who they are. First, we have Chris Christensen of Bryce Technology, CEO and founder of that company, Pacom Ravillon of Euroconsult, and Tim Farrar of TMF Associates. Um, the idea here is to spend about 60 minutes talking about some of the uh, salient occurrences in the space industry. This is an industry thing. We're not going to be doing too much of the marvels of, of planets and what you can find in a lunar sample on this one. It's mainly commercial stuff or business stuff or government stuff. Um, let me start with, with Chris. If you could, Chris, give us your idea of what you thought 2020 looked like, how much you think COVID affected things, if at all. It's, there's an argument on, to made on in both directions, I guess and what you think 2021 looks like as a consequence. Uh, thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, a pleasure to be on a panel with the uh, other uh, very knowledgeable uh, uh, speakers. I look forward to hearing what everyone's thoughts are. I would say, <clears throat> to me, what's it, the most extraordinary thing about 2020 is continuity and growth across the entire space ecosystem particularly in light of, of COVID. Uh, while certainly some industries and businesses uh, face challenges and were significantly affected overall, we have seen growth um, with regard to exploration programs. We have seen growth with regard to military and intelligence space activities. We have seen growth with regard to uh, venture investment in space. We have seen growth with regards to satellite deployment and launch activity. So across the board, I would say that, that growth and continuity are, are the big stories. Certainly COVID has had an effect um, early on. I think that there was a bit of a chilling effect on investment uh, as investors evaluated this unprecedented situation, uh, considered whether they needed to preserve capital to for venture investors to focus in on their portfolio companies, um, at large institutional players. Uh, we're looking across the economic ecosystem to determine what outcomes might be. Um, with regard to the satellite industry, certainly uh, communication services that are associated with travel and transportation and logistics uh, saw reduced revenues. Uh, increased demand for uh, communication for um, um, uh, end user broadband, for example, uh, and some secondary consequences to the space industry associated with the aviation impacts on major players such as Boeing and Airbus, certainly relevant. We saw an early pause in launches, particularly where uh, uh, people had to fly from different countries to participate in the launch activity uh, with launch pace picking up and resuming um, uh, later in the year. Uh, so that's, that's sort of my overall view of what happened. I look forward to a conversation in more detail as we move along. 
Sounds good. All right, I have to go and be thinking of three events you think would, would be top your list of things that either the most surprising to you, the most illustrative of the things you've just mentioned in terms of general trends, or just stuff that was off the wall, because there are a couple of things I think were off the wall. And uh, before I give mine, I want you guys to give yours just two or three thing, concrete things that actually happened that you thought were wow type events. Let me move to Pacom. Pacom, Ravillon of your consult. How, did, how do you think 2020 turned out? Uh, well, I would certainly not disagree with what, what Carissa suggested. So I think uh, resilience is still a big word for the industry across the board. That's one, one aspect to consider. Um, so with regards to COVID-19 and maybe to give a, a, a bit of compliment, I think where it impacted what was very much in the communication sector, but also in a variety of countries where, you know, installing to the ground, installing new services, uh, new antennas, so more data when you have already connectivity, but to install new people, to make new decisions, to engage into new program has been hampered in, in, in many places. So I think this had impacted and, um, on the one side, you could see a set of satellite operators, or let's say incumbent players in the industry still suffering or transforming. And what we saw in, in this year has really been an acceleration in some, you know, chapter 11 restructuring process for certain companies that had pending financial issues on the one side, but also uh, quite a number, not all, all of them so visible, but strategic partnerships, would it be between, uh, Microsoft getting in in a stronger way, or uh, an Inmarsa going after uh, uh, signing a partnership with the use, an Intelsat with a GoGo, um, a Utahsat getting deeper into downstream and service delivery in Europe for broadband. So quite a lot of movement behind the screen, not all of them big deals, but I think more, more kind of strategic partnership or transactions that took place in the last few years. And all of them questions of vertical integration, the future model and economics working with it. So. I think it's also pretty big drivers going in the general direction of further digitization and things being pushed by COVID and, and dynamics that players could see. Yeah. And Pakam, when you say impacted, a couple of examples you gave, you're talking about both up and down, I guess, huh? Positively yeah, and well, I, I think on the one side, certainly uh, impacted can be uh, lower revenues. I mean, uh, Carissa mentioned about IRO, but could be also about cruise ships, anyone, you know, um, yeah exposed to any transportation industry could be deeply impacted for sure. Uh, on the positive side, it's clear that some players could see higher growth, you know, some players in maritime, a, a KVH service provider could see accelerated consumption at a good year, overperforming against uh, some of its track records. So yeah, there can be goods and bads depending on where you sit. Um, but uh, across the board, one of the direction could be, and I would expect to see some more either strategic partnership or, or deals or uh, new positions taking on investors in, in the next one to two years. So I think it could only be kind of the beginning of a cycle of further movement through the ecosystem between, between players. Fair enough. Okay. You mentioned a couple of specific things, but I want you to think if you want sure. to include those in your top three or four later on, because I want to get that get from you, the things you thought were particularly important. Tim, let me move to you Tim, for our TMF associates. How do you look at 2020? Well, I guess the, the classic statement of a year of two halves. I mean, the first half of the year was filled with bankruptcies and uh, restructurings, uh, OneWeb, uh, Intelsat, uh, Speedcast, uh, Global Eagle, you know, everything looked pretty terrible. Um, and yet it's turned around in the second half very abruptly. And now we're, we're seeing very speculative, uh, you know, deals. Uh, you know, just yesterday we saw AST, uh, you know, which is so reminiscent of the uh, the 1990s and back to the uh, uh, you know cellular anywhere that we all love to uh, to see with uh, Iridium, and then again 10 years ago with Legado and Terrastar. Um, you know, it, so uh, and I think the sort of turning point was probably uh, in July when we saw. Uh, the rescue of OneWeb by the UK government and Barty, uh, combined with the $1.9 billion fundraising from SpaceX. And that sort of really set things on a different trajectory. And, and now I think we're in a position where, um, you know, it seems like almost anything, however uh, speculative and, uh, and in many ways crazy, could be funded. 
Um, you know, pe people talking just the last few days about uh, SpaceX doubling its valuation, whether that's going to happen or not remains to be seen. Uh, but there's just a, an awful lot of money being thrown at things right now. Uh, and I think SpaceX actually bringing a terminal to market and starting to, to serve people, getting money from the FCC's auction, um, and just really, it's been very notable in the last three months how much uh, SpaceX's uh, progress uh, with Starlink has really influenced the behavior of all the satellite operators. It, it's a lot like uh, Tesla in a way, uh, you know, it sells a tiny proportion of the world's cars, but sets the uh, agenda for everyone else in the auto industry around the world. Uh, and I think Starlink's uh, uh, doing that despite only having a handful of customers. Yeah. Gee, I wish Starlink's uh, P&L was as open as Tesla's, you know? <laughs> I think you might be more worried if it was, but uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I suspect you're right. Um, all right, Chris, you've had enough time now. Give me three or four things you thought were wow moments for you, things you wouldn't have expected or you might have expected, but were just big deals. So the launch pace was a big deal. By uh, a 2022 date, uh, we've seen uh, 1,229 spacecraft launched. The previous record year was something like that, 500, and that was quite recent. Mm -hmm. uh, 833 of those, if I'm getting it right, were Starlink. Uh, that's extraordinary. Now, putting that in context, if you look at total up mass for 2020, the total amount of mass that's been launched, it's a very modest increase over previous years because these satellites are very small. They're not driving launch rate. They're not driving the number of launches, but that number of satellites being deployed when you know the number of active satellites on orbit is on the order of 2,500 is yep. incredible. Um, two, Tim uh, stole my thunder there a little bit uh, by mentioning OneWeb and there are two pieces to why OneWeb is extraordinary. The first piece, is really important not to forget bankruptcy, right? You know, massively uh, uh, closely watched uh, uh, company uh, with a constellation that had been one of the largest recipients of the billions of dollars of investment we've seen flown into venture funded firms uh, over the last five years, got into such financial difficulties that it, it was in existential danger. And then the flip side of that, that the UK government stepped in and committed to OneWeb to the tune of a half a billion do, uh, pounds and significant uh, uh, ongoing, uh, a potentially significant ongoing role. Uh, to me, that is very emblematic of the uh, interplay between commercial and government mission needs and requirements. Governments are looking at space to drive economic growth, to uh, uh, buttress their national security, uh, to uh, uh, define and energize their, their STEM and, and science research programs. And so while commercial space has been such a focal point for the last several years, and we've seen, again, so much venture investment flow in that's really uh, transformational, mm -hmm. that the fact that that highly visible commercial firm needed a government partner to move forward. That to me says a lot about how we will see things play out in the future. And uh, the third thing is not a particular event, but I think it's worth noting that we've seen so many productivity gains uh, for space capabilities, launch prices have dropped. On-orbit capacity, even putting aside the LEO systems, has increased dramatically by a factor of something like three, uh, just because of high throughput satellites. So the you know we've we've seen the I, I, I hesitate to invoke Moore's law because it's so casually applied, but but the idea of dramatically increasing capability for the same price. Uh, it, Long-standing space systems have been demonstrating that, and it really, I think, was very visible in 2020. So those are the three that that uh, I would highlight. That was the, certainly, one of those was on my top top uh, top three list as well. Pakom. Well, so I, I have to try to pick uh, uh, other others we want. So no, 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 uh, no, 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 no. Consensus is no, a good no, thing. No, but I no, I, I mean, I I would certainly agree with with Carissa, but I mean, I, I think the. Uh, the the series of events around C band in the US, I think, is still pretty major for at least all the stakeholders involved. Um, 
uh, I think obviously it flows through the operators themselves and the, the, the cash inflow that they would get some to the, from the process to the fact that, uh, you know, the um, backlog of several manufacturers on the geo side got a push from that. So through the ecosystem, if you look at the impact, it's pretty large. Uh, across the players um, and, and certainly will have impacts uh, down the road for, for a number of stakeholders. And obviously you see some other countries thinking of their own review process around C-band, et cetera. So some of the consequences shall be felt across the world in the coming years, including in Asia, typically very relevant for, for the APSCC. Uh, that's one. So in terms of the fundraising, quite spectacular, I think, it's also worth mentioning about China and startups and companies there. Um, so we see the dynamics in the US and you know the prospective IPOs and so forth. But if we look at what's taking place in China at the moment, it is relatively similar. Obviously, definitely not the same framework and ecosystem. But when you look at the cash inflows into the launch sector or certain other businesses, you know, from AI to remote sensing. Uh, Clearly, there is a strong push there, and just you know, just the, the latest mission to and back from the moons uh, is is also an important event in terms of the general competition and framework. And that could be one mention as part of the global dynamics for space exploration and back to the moon, where it's it's there is a question of technology leadership, and there is clearly a government commitment, and I think that takes place into that overall stream. Just to mention yeah. one of the latest. Fair enough. No, that and uh, and and Japan getting an asteroid sample back, uh, yeah. the UAE going to Mars. I mean, there was there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. The US casts such a bright light sometimes, it's it's easy to hide other lights elsewhere. And there's a lot going on um, in the private sector in China, even though some of the US don't like to admit that it's not necessarily tethered to the government, at least not directly. And there is a lot of it going on uh, and a bunch of other nations as well. Um, Tim, top three or four. Well, Again, trying to pick something slightly different, I, I would highlight this, uh, the Intel SAT acquisition of GoGo as sort of you know, reinforcing a trend we've seen somewhat in, in, in recent years of, uh, you know, Viasat and Inmarsat going more direct to satellite operators. Uh, you know, now Intelsat's jumped on the bandwagon of that. We've also obviously seen Utelsat with, with Big Blue, uh, you know, uh, bulking up its retail presence. Uh, I, I think we're really on a, a trend, you know, driven by the fact that the cost of bandwidth, uh, you know, is falling. Uh, satellite operators are worried about how they gain more of the value chain because they realize that just getting involved in a price war, selling capacity uh, on its own, allowing you know distributors to really play them off against one another, um, is is not a great way to be going in the future. And I think that it is, uh, you know, very relevant to to think of that continuing. I mean, SES is doing things in its own way as well, selling a lot more O3B direct. So I think that that trend is going to continue, and it's only going to be reinforced by people getting concerned about uh, threats from Starlink, for example, uh, where it's very clear that they're going uh, largely direct uh, uh, into the market. Seems to be all right. Let me ask the th three with the same question. So, on the Intelsat purchase of GoGo's commercial aviation, um, talk about buy, you know, catching a falling knife, right? Um, unlike Utelsat's investment in Big Blue, which you know, the timing of that seems okay. Now, timing is, is, is as it does, and it can disappear. And in two years, maybe we'll think about it a different way. But given the commitments GoGo has to other satellite operators, and given what Airbus and Boeing are saying about the, about the timing of a recovery of commercial air traffic to where it was in January of 2020, we'll see what happens now. The vaccines are coming, but they're talking about something not in 2021, more like mid-2022, maybe 2023. Uh, and let's assume for the moment that a lot of those $600, $700 million in go-go contracts, including some with Intelsat, are not easily breakable. And you know that some of them are not. Uh, will we, If we had to, this meeting... Two years from now, you think the Intelsat purchase of GoGo, -Go, despite its long-term strategic logic, will be viewed as a good deal or a bad deal, just in terms of, you know, here's 500 million bucks, let's see what we do. Tim, I'm starting with you. Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I would say 
it's a good strategic deal. Uh, whether it's a good price to pay, I think you know you look at the reaction of GoGo shareholders and how much GoGo's share price went up on the announcement of the deal. Uh, clearly, GoGo shareholders think it's a great deal for them. Uh, and usually in these things, if it's a great deal for the seller, it's not necessarily quite as good a deal for the buyer. Uh, so, but but it was a competitive situation. I, I think there's no question that. You know, everyone felt GoGo was the best asset out there on the market. Uh, you know, much better uh, presence, uh, be more terminals out there. Uh, you know, a better customer base. Uh, all of those things played in its favour in terms of uh, you know being a unique asset that people have paid up for. Uh, and and time will tell. I mean, we go back a few years and we see uh, you know Tales buying Live TV again in a a very competitive auction. They paid an awful lot for it. And, and probably in retrospect, they overpaid. But you yep. can see the logic and the strategy associated with it. And, 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 and at the end of the day, uh, you know, $400 million. Well, I mean, Intelsat's a business that's worth many, many billions. So, uh, uh, you know, it's more about what it says about the direction of the company uh, that's probably more important than the precise price being paid. Yeah, we could talk later about what Intel said as a company is worth many, many billions, but I guess that, that's a question of valuation that, that others can make. Carissa, uh, the Intel sat deal with GoGo, what do you think of it? It's interesting, Peter. I, I, we've been doing some work lately uh, and have had occasion to look at that question of when does business travel re return back, when does air, air travel return back to previous levels? <laughs> and uh, estimates range from kind of sort of a baseline industry estimate that's actually reaching 2019 levels in 2024 to, <clears throat> excuse me, much more dire views that say we're, we're going to see a post-COVID fundamental transformation in business operations and activities that will dramatically depress travel. Yep. Uh, our, uh, our view certainly is that the likelihood is more that we will see a return to pre-COVID levels and, and future growth just given the, the what, what we've seen historically. Um, there was a great quotation about uh, <clears throat> how the introduction of the fax machine would mean the end of business travel, uh, which I, I think we can agree perhaps has not been the case. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the, uh, assuming the ability to survive the, the, the impact of the COVID blip that the strategic value of the acquisition is not significantly diminished uh, by, by this situation. So if you thought it was a good idea, absent this slowdown in, uh, in demand, it will continue to be a good idea if you, if you thought it wasn't. Uh, uh, and to me, uh, one of the keys is just ease of use and integration of the service. And I think that the GoGo acquisition is going to help with that. Okay, D despite the ongoing commitments that GoGo has, now Intelsat has to other satellite fleets, and despite the fact that if your numbers are right, if those numbers you quoted are right, three or four years before we get back to pre-COVID commercial <laughs> to full travel. level. That doesn't necessarily mean, so you can certainly, you could certainly see growth in use of um, uh, on-orbit, uh, sorry, uh, in in-plane communication services, right. even while you see a depressed number of travelers, you can see a, you can see a transformation of that experience. So um, I, I, I would be, cautiously optimistic. Fair enough. Okay. Back home. Yeah, I would say uh, I, mean, I would certainly agree around the scenarios. We've been looking at that on, on, on recovery. So, I mean, this being said, the fundamentals that connectivity to the aircraft for passengers, but also use shall have an increasing value. And, you know, Delta some months ago uh, made statements about willingness to go to, to Wi-Fi. I mean, free Wi broadband really experience on board. So, the direction is, is there and for potential midterm growth in the US. Uh, the deal reminds me a little so on a situation years ago of in Marsat against, you know, a Stratos or, or Visa at the time. Okay, the market is pretty consolidated. There are so many out there. What has been driving KU bands or that agenda, at least as a technology platform, has been IFC in the US in particular and many other places. So it's, it could be seen as much as an, you know, a defensive move as a growth option for Intelsat. Um, so certainly there is a question of the other deals with other operators. I think 
on the one side, the main strategic issue is whether the KU band platform or the future capacity of Intelsat will be together with the GoGo service platform, what is relevant for airlines a few years down the road. I think obviously KU band is there to stay because you don't change uh, an antenna every morning. So it's still there for a number of years, but in terms of the growth story, it's very much about how their strategic plan will match uh, expectation from, from the airlines. And one of the weakness of service providers in recent years, and we've been working with several airlines was the ability to really confirm what kind of capacity will be offered available five years, six years, seven years down the road and the economics, which has been the strength of a Viasat. They had asset, they had a Viasat three story coming, etc which other KU band providers struggled a little to deliver because it was dependent on the relationship and decision from satellite operators in terms of roadmap. So the combination can make sense, but then they have to really make sure the value proposition end to end is relevant for the airline, you know, looking at their 20, 26, seven broadband expectation. Yeah, all right. Really um, Tim, let me ask you to address something that Pat just mentioned because I think it's important. I'm going to stick on aero stuff for a couple of minutes because as many of our audience will know, this is one of the few clear growth areas for SATCOM that everybody agrees is going to be growing because all of us want to use uh, uh, the internet on aircraft. And what you can do is Chris uh, alluded to about with, with inside the cockpit uh, is also coming in. So everybody agrees that's going to grow. Whether there's a dip because of COVID is another thing, but long-term it's going to grow. Tim, let's say that uh, one brave CEO of, say, Delta, because um, he's made uh, some comments about this, decides to jump in all in and say, I want to go free Wi-Fi as soon as I can. You can't really, can you? Well, not with the current platform in the sense of the amount of capacity that GoGo -Go has committed to. So, so that obviously is one of the big issues. I mean, the value in GoGo -Go is, is you're buying it on a bet that in the future uh, we'll get away from this problem that no one wants to pay for it and it's all expensive and, and tiresome uh, and, and that we'll go to an all free model uh, and that the airlines will pay. Uh, and I think the biggest uncertainty about COVID is not the fact that there's a downturn there's a downturn it's going to turn around to some degree at some point in the future not too long away is it a few months is it a year who knows but the question of what that does to airline balance sheets is a much bigger question can delta afford to go free when the market recovers you know will will it mean that they want to push towards free more quickly because uh, they feel that it will give them a competitive advantage coming out of, of the crisis in the same way as some airlines have pushed towards uh, you know, blocking middle seats more aggressively than others because they think it's giving them a competitive advantage. So, so what happens there uh, and whether Delta can afford it? Because it's not just can you afford to pay however many hundred thousand dollars a year for the capacity needed for free, you're going to need to upgrade things that you have already. Uh, you, you may need to move to different systems. You may need new antennas. As Packham's pointed out, are you going to still be in KU or are you going to move to KA? Well, I mean, I'm assuming Intelsat bought it because they thought they were going to stick with KU, but, uh, you know, we've got to see how that plays out because, because clearly, you know, GoGo has said that they looked at a number of alternatives in terms of future capacity supply and they, and they were agnostic to KU versus KA going forward, if, depending on what customers wanted. So I think, but I think it does all come back to that question of what is the balance sheets of the airlines look like? What can they afford? What do they want to do competitively? Because if we stick with the current model where passengers have to pay in large part, and there's only minor adjustments with limited free services or messaging or something like that, then we're gonna be caught with a situation where the ARPUs uh, are very low and, and too low, especially internationally. They're, they're vastly lower outside the US than they are inside the US. Um, no one's found a great model uh, yet in other parts of the world uh, in terms of uh, uh, how to pay for this thing and, and how to make it uh, a viable situ uh, you know, situation economically, even if it's a big differentiator for the airline is, you know, if they can't afford to give you a full can of Coke, uh, then can they afford to give you free Wi-Fi? 
Wait a minute. They're cutting back on. They're, they're reducing. They're cutting full cans in half now. I haven't. <laughs> Uh, well, the last few flights I was on last year, a lot of the time it was like, okay, here's your top up. Uh, and if you want more, come back to me. All right. Um, well, I guess the question is, one of the things that Delta, uh, Carissa, let me ask you about this. Um, and if you haven't looked at this, okay, you can't, you can't look at everything. Um, but one of the things the Delta CEO said was it, uh, I believe it was him, he said, you know, there's not enough KU band capacity available for a free Wi-Fi service for the major U.S. airlines, just U.S. Um, Globally, that's probably true as well. So you're in Delsat. What do you do now? You own that solution and you also own the problem. So what do you do? Do you start immediately investing in k band satellites, assuming you've got the wherewithal coming out of Chapter 11? Well, I'm going to go back, loop this back to the airline business case, uh, because I am not uh, completely persuaded that free Wi-Fi for all <clears throat> is the most uh, advantageous pathway. Airlines right now operate at very thin margins and have profitability driven by premium passengers. And so yes. the, the question I would ask is, is there a way to optimize service, improve the quality of service for premium passengers, uh, use the availability of the service to attract, uh, to, to create a competitive advantage with regard to attracting premium passengers, as opposed to provide the service to every passenger. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced that, that a capacity gap with regard to serving every flyer really translates into a need to invest. I think that we would want to understand the economics of that much more precisely and, be, and, and consider the effect on the premium passenger as a priority. So a freemium type of thing where business and first class maybe get it, but you're still paying for the service in, in coach. Or, or they get, uh, uh, they get um, uh, you limit the access in coach uh, uh, in order to ensure that capacity is available for your premium passengers. It's not an attractive, um, um, it's not an attractive principle, but from a business standpoint, it might no. be the, the, the more viable. These are the people who are financing the flights, basically, yep. not people, not cheap people like me. Um, Pacom, what do you, what do you think about this? First on the capacity issue, on what, what choices Intelsat is going to be faced with and on whether free Wi-Fi that several CEOs of airlines have been talking about even in the last eight months, which has been surprising to me, is something that's coming or as Chris has suggested, maybe there's something they want to look twice at. Well, I, I think in any case, it's a matter of trade-off because to the statement like, uh, it being, is there enough capacity for free Wi-Fi over the US today? No, if you were to do that, whatever the cost, your service will be absolutely terrible because you just don't have enough bandwidth. So that's a fact of life, actually. Uh, in my view, if you want to move from a situation of a 5, 10 megabit per aircraft, more or less, to a 30 Mbps at least that you may need for a short haul flight, well, you need more or less capacity cost to be divided by three, you know, not exactly the economics. I think airline may want to spend a bit more, but they just as you go from 3G, 4G, 5G, it will be consistent with the cost and volume of capacity. So if you look at, at the horizon over the next three to five years, it's a matter of the next gen aircraft. You know, would it be KA, but would it use a flexible KU system? And really how far can they go in terms of economics and bringing the extra layer or the NCSO, but in my view, the maturity of antennas, et cetera, tends to push them more to 20, 24, 5 plus to be a really a, a good solution for a major deployment for an airline, or at least you, you are a good couple of years out before you have you know, all the certification, everything you need to have sufficient comfort for sure. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, the volume of bandwidth and the cost of it will be the key. Uh, whether you can generate ancillary revenue, improved operations, I'm, uh, well, airlines look at it, it's still difficult to really transform the economics out of that in the, in the near term. Uh, but this being said, if at a point a player like Delta is really working on its agenda and delivering, I think other airlines will have to make a move as well. So there shall be a form of neighboring effect. So next year is a bit short, three, four years out, depending also on, you know, COVID status, there is survival and then there is everything you can uh, offer. Uh, I think 
really, if you look at new satellites, 2023 to four being really into the market available when you can start to deploy it where things might change in a much uh, faster way. So for Intelsat, well, I think it's very much a question of their agenda for what may, might be the, you know, Epic 2 series of satellites, uh, what could be the next gen, how much can they deliver and how much could be in the KU band and, and others because what I suspect is you could also see in the US fleet keeping KU for a part, picking something else for another because there might not be just one solution good for everything or that delivers enough for the right economics and it can take months to install or reinstall uh, aircraft. And right now, several service providers are even reduced their staff <laughs> or their installation capability really short term. So uh, they also have to go through that cycle. To, you know, it's one thing to be willing to deliver a new solution. It's another to get it installed and available to the passengers themselves. Okay. All right. We're rounding about the 75% mark here. Um, uh, audience members of these types of things get angry if you don't talk about constellations. And they've been doing that for years. And I've resisted that because the constellations haven't been worth it. But now they are. Now they are. Um, so Carissa mentioned one of the salient features of 2020, which is the 800 plus satellites launched by Starlink, SpaceX, which means that they are on their way, we'll see what happens, on their way to meeting their FCC and ITU regulatory milestone deadlines, which was not a small thing to do, but they look like they're, be, they're doing it at one or two launches a month of 60 satellites each. OneWeb, uh, we already mentioned the, the coming out of bankruptcy and OneWeb uh, is now back to launching. They still will be launching 30 or 35 satellites a month. Um, we have uh, Telesat, uh, whose two uh, shareholders, long arguing, a pension fund in Canada and Laurel Space of New York, a publicly traded company whose main asset was Telesat, um, coming together and agreeing that Telesat we brought into Laurel and Telesat would now be part of a, of a, of a, of a publicly traded company. Uh, and tell us that shareholders have now come out publicly for the first time that I, that I can recall, clearly in favor of their Leo broadband. So that makes three that, are, that seem more likely than they did a while ago. Um, let's at least give them the three. Uh, never mind what might be going on in China, where two look maybe kind of feasible, or what might be going on in Europe outside OneWeb, which doesn't look feasible yet, or at least not credible enough to be worth much attention from us now. Uh, let's let me start with with uh, with Starlink. Um, do you guys agree with me that it's just amazing that uh, SpaceX is going to be launching this often uh, and not getting a cent for it? I mean, this is a cost to SpaceX launching all these satellites, and a cost to SpaceX of making the antennas, and a cost to SpaceX of delivering the entire gig. Um, uh, how long can this go on? Um, Carissa, I'm starting with you. <clears throat> SpaceX is fascinating because it's at the scale of a, you know, increasingly at the scale of a, an enterprise uh, firm. Uh, it, it, it has relationships with the government that look like a defense contractor. And its financial situation is very, it's, it's very aligned with a, a venture funded startup in, in, uh, in some ways in that it is uh, uh, pursuing a very ambitious growth path and it is funding and fueling that growth path, at least in part with um, risk tolerant private capital. Yep. And so I think the answer to your question, how long this goes on, Peter, is longer than we would think given uh, our experience in a more industrial space, uh, uh, space industry. Um, <clears throat> There's deployment of the system, there is operation of the system, and then there's moving into the, the, the period of actually closing the business case and operating the system profitably. Uh, none of, achieving one of those phases does not mean the next phase will be achieved successfully. So a fully deployed operational system does not necessarily translate into a profitable business uh, that, that can pay back that that investment. Uh, SpaceX has had no problem. Well, that's not true. SpaceX has been able to raise the funds that it needs 
It has recently received uh, US government funding in a very substantial amount for um, a rural uh, a broadband service. And so uh, I would have a, a pretty optimistic view about the deployment phase. They're gonna deploy, they're gonna fully deploy. Okay, but don't wiggle out of the question here. As a business, as a business, as a business, um, as you said, deployment doesn't mean a success as a business. So there have been there's been lots of speculation on what the cost it is for them to build each one of their ground antennas, yeah. um, and you reduce that once you get up to scale. Uh, whether they keep that in house or not, I don't know, but that's a question mark. Sure. Uh, and there's a question mark as how much they can continue with most of their activity and launches being for their own company that's not paying them for launches? So the, I, I, and, and my answer is that the, they, they will deploy. So, so uh, investment funded launches, the investment funding will, will uh, support the deployment, yeah. will support those launches. Uh, in, as long as, as um, the vision is attractive to investors and there are and, and there's capital available, there, it is certainly feasible to see SpaceX attract additional capital for that early stage period of operations where they're clearly going to be subsidizing terminals, they're clearly going to be subsidizing service to some uh, to some extent. SpaceX has also been extremely ex successful in the past at blending that kind of the commercial business case doesn't close with providing services to the government that provides additional capital to, to lever up the, the impact of that investment capital. So deployment, yes. Early operations, yes. Will the business case close? I've been talking for years about the uncertainty around demand for this service. Mm -hmm. Competition for space capabilities with terrestrial providers is notoriously very, very difficult. And so I think that there is still, I, I can't, cannot hazard a confident answer. There's still a huge amount of uncertainty to me about whether and how that business case will close in the operational phase. Yeah. How, how important do you think to the closing of the business case is the U.S. Uh, intelligence service and the U.S. Department of Defense? Uh, generally speaking, uh, U.S. government and, and, and certainly uh, the national security community as a potential customer uh, has been a critical part of SpaceX's business case from the beginning. And so absolutely, uh, those customers will contribute, whether they'll contribute enough, enough and how they'll contribute, whether it will be buying hardware or using service at a, at a very substantial level. Those are two really different um, scenarios. And I don't, I don't think that that answer is known by anyone at this point. I don't think government decision makers have determined where they'll be. And I don't think they will make that determination until see, they see what their performance looks like. Fair enough. All right, Pakom, Starlink, what do you make of it as a business? First, were you as surprised as, as I was that they are actually launching as they, as they must in order to make their regulatory milestones? Um, well, it's a good question. There are plenty of views. It's, it's the, I think, the best topic for any coffee break this year in the team in the office. So um, I think, uh, well, their ability to deploy, the, the fact they could go as fast with as many satellites, uh, whether it's a, it's a surprise or really at the top of what could have been expected, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, it's been very aggressive. And if you think through the COVID period and the ability to build and to launch and to raise the funding, it's still honestly uh, an amazing um, achievement uh, yeah. for, for the year 2020, um, to, to be fair. Um, uh, so to the business case, I think one question pending is still how many satellites exactly they need and will deploy to have their Gen 1 and, and where they will stop, I think is still a kind of a fair question. Uh, which is also is not without an impact on the factories and launch space and everything that comes with it in terms of, of the cost behind. Um, at this stage and with the level of you know, uh, ambition and how far they go, it looks very much as an equity play, as, as Gary Sack kind of suggested. It's a matter of valuation, how attractive you are or the long-term prospect. Obviously, the company with its milestone and being also too big to fail and being our non-core supplier to US government and some other achievements like FCC are contributing to 
creating a long-term value to the asset, which shareholders shall be focused on in terms of adding money or not in it. Uh, the short-term execution, you know, when would you be uh, at break-even from an EBITDA standpoint? And can you make a return on the first generation? Um, is an incredible challenge for any constellation. And, uh, and it's where, why so far, if you look at the level of equity raising versus debt raising, actually the level of debt raised by any constellation project at the moment is pretty small, not to say that it's still to happen. Um, so really, in my view, it's like of a middle term story for any constellation still having an encore tenant. I'm not sure the US government or defense can by itself make it a profitable operation. But the fact to have encore tenant shall be key. So clearly having the ability to have a, a sizable market in US broadband is certainly key because if you want to make all of your return, given the constellation side, out of creating business uh, one by one in Angola, Ethiopia, you know, the Philippines and others, it just takes time, a lot of time to, to have every, any, everything in place and to create the business. Um, so in terms they of- To do that, they have to do that, don't they? They can't just contend no, they, with North America and Europe. They, they, they have to do that, but if you think of equity investors and to start with having encore clients that keep the business running and the promise, I think the, the US market by itself is, is a very important piece in the equation, in my view, and the ability to secure sufficient business there. All right, Tim, Starlink as a business. Well, I think you know, there's a famous statement that the market can stay irrational for longer than you can stay solvent. And that's uh, pretty much how all the other satellite operators are feeling right now. Uh, you know, it is a big shock to everyone. Um, and I think it's very hard to predict, uh, you know, whether this is 1999, 2000 again, uh, you know, or, you know, are we much earlier in the cycle? Uh, but it does seem that things are uh, particularly out of balance at the moment in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the willingness, uh, you know, to suspend disbelief about things. Uh, I mean, I, on the US government side, I'd say uh, I'm quite prepared to take the bet that Starlink uh, and SpaceX's satellite manufacturing will get more money from the US government in the next three years than it will get from commercial customers. Uh, and I think it's quite plausible that that will be the same over the next five years, uh, you know, in terms of their, their ability to ramp up and their ability to to get the tens of millions of customers they've claimed. Uh, I mean, Elon Musk has a, an aura and a fan base uh, mm -hmm. and has made an, an awful lot of uh, progress uh, without needing, you know, explicit advertising and, uh, and marketing and subscriber acquisition costs at the same level as a Viasat or a Hughes, uh, but it's certainly, you know, shaking up the industry and, it, and it's going to have an impact on uh, Viasat and Hughes, for example, in the US. So there's no question that, you know, if you're, uh, you know, those companies between them need to bring in about 100,000 new customers every quarter just to uh, offset the churn that's ongoing in their business. Uh, and if you are a potential subscriber, you're sitting there thinking, why would I sign up for that now when I can, you know, Starlink will be here in a few months. I mean, yes, it's Elon time, but people are prepared to believe that it will be here in a few months. Um, and it's going to have a negative effect. Um, I mean, I think one way I look at it is, you know, Viasat was the SpaceX of the 2000s and yep. even the early 2010s. It had a lot of the same characteristics. It went for rapid cycling of technology, it got into building its own uh, satellites, you know, it's done all the sorts of things that now SpaceX is doing, and, and therefore, in many ways, it's the most vulnerable of the companies to that competition. Uh, you know, how does uh, Viasat justify now going ahead and doing yet more beyond Viasat 3? Uh, you know, it, it, it's very, very difficult for everyone else here. Uh, and whether or not, you know, this ultimately attracts tens of millions of subscribers, which I think certainly has to be in considerable doubt. Um, it's going to affect everyone else in the industry uh, to varying degrees, but in most cases, very significant degrees over the next uh, three to five years. How, how crucial would you think it is to the Starlink business that they get landing rights in places like India, China, Pakistan, Nigeria, that's what? 
Well, I don't think it's critical to their ability to raise funds at this point in time. And who knows how long that ability to raise essentially unlimited amounts of capital will continue. Um, I would say, you know, go back and look at Tesla. How important is China uh, to Tesla? Well, it's pretty important right now. Um, but India and Pakistan, probably less so. And certainly Africa is not really important to Tesla. Uh, I mean, Starlink is going to follow many of the same paths. It's going to be about where the money is. And the money in satellite broadband is mostly in North America right now. Uh, and then to a lesser extent in Australia, uh, parts of Europe, um, mm -hmm. you know, follow the money, basically. Yeah. But isn't the growth in broadband in the world in the next five, 10 years, mainly in India and China? Well, the problem is you've got an expensive terminal and uh, a service that you need to make a return on. So uh, it's all very well to say, you know, the market is mostly in India and China, but the amount those people pay per month, you know, the ARPUs are you know, $10 or something like that, uh, maybe $20 in, in, in some cases. Um, that's not going to be enough to pay for a $500 terminal, you know, uh, and it's certainly not enough to pay for the full cost of a terminal. Uh, so, I mean, you're sort of stuck. You have to go for other models or you just have to cream skim uh, and try and grab a few uh, high income customers in the same way as, you know, Tesla creams the uh, off the electric car market with people who are pay up for the brand and the experience and, uh, uh, you know, have a lot of money to, th to throw at this sort of thing. All right. Um, we've only got a few minutes left and I can't, I can't uh, ignore the other constellations. We haven't talked about Amazon's Kuiper, uh, which is worth talking about because they can throw $10 billion at this problem and not blink. That's clear. Um, and, but I want to go back to OneWeb. Uh, Carissa, uh, OneWeb was pulled out of bankruptcy, as you mentioned, by uh, the British government for reasons that are, let's say, interesting. Um, not sure that they're fully known yet. It's not the best way to stimulate British industry by buying a Florida factory, but never mind that. Um, they bought it out with Barty, a big cellular operator in India. Uh, do you see those as strange bedfellows? There's a logic between the two of them that's complementary, or do you see them as eventually in conflict? <clears throat> Uh, Peter, I think you put your, your finger on the, the key question here, which is the uncertainty around the, the, the policy framework that, that within which OneWeb is going to fit. Uh, the UK, as, as uh, you, you uh, well know, has been focusing on space as a driver of national prosperity and economic growth, um, has invested in manufacturing, has invested in <clears throat> supporting downstream capability, certainly views OneWeb as having its, its home and its genesis uh, in the UK, despite, <clears throat> as you say, the um, uh, very significant asset of the factory in Florida. So uh, how that future looks is going to be shaped by how OneWeb is used as a tactical asset in support of both economic growth and national security. Uh, uh, related applications uh, mm -hmm. by the UK government. And my sense is that that is, <clears throat> that, that OneWeb is being treated as an opportunity and that the process now is an exploratory process as opposed to one, the, the investment being made for a very specific purpose uh, that, that's being walked forward. And so I don't know the answer to your question until I have a better right. sense of how it's gonna fit in. But did you, as I was, were you as I was gobsmacked by the, 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 the arrival of this comet shooting through the sky out of nowhere and the UK government coming in and saying, we will now save you? I'm going to point that question to Tim. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Tim, we, uh, gobsmacked not, might not be what you were, but, but were you at least, uh, I don't know, tickled pink or... or surprised even at least slightly i mean come on it did seem to come out of nowhere very quickly well i think it's one of these unique situations i mean you know where were we in june we're in the middle of a you know crisis on every dimension uh, in terms of uh, what was happening with covid um mm -hmm. you know 
things were pretty unique back then. And, and I think you know, the irony is if you look at this, you know, six months later, where all the satellite operators are completely panic stricken about Starlink as, a, as an existential threat to their future, however, you know, real that is, or, or, or however much of a threat that really is, I think if we were, you know, if the same situation was happening today, we there'd be a very different situation in terms of interest in in the bankruptcy, uh, you know, court from from a lot of satellite operators. So, I mean, it, it, it's interesting to go back to what you said about there's a shortage of KU capacity. I think people tend to forget that there's both Starlink and OneWeb are KU band systems, mm -hmm. uh, and they're bringing a lot of capacity to the market. And and you know, Intelsat three years ago was perfectly prepared not least because it had no money to spend on satellites to bet its future capacity growth on on OneWeb. So I think that we were in a very unique situation in June that led to a very unique outcome. Uh, where we are now uh, is very different. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, all the satellite operators look very different at LEO, uh, you know, in the context of Starlink, but also, you know, uh, in the context of OneWeb, because obviously, you know, lots of people were predicting OneWeb would go away and we'd all be done with Leo by now and, and it was all a passing fad. Uh, and that's absolutely not where we are right now. Okay, but I asked you about the compatibility of, of Barty with the British government and you sort of throw your hands up and say it's a unique situation and then walk, <laughs> walk away. No, 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 you've got to at least give me a partial answer. Do you see compatibility, complementarity between those two major investors? Well, I, I, I think it's very difficult to answer in the sense of, you know, I don't think anyone knows what the objectives are other than to make a commercial success of this business. I mean, yeah. both of them have an interest in not losing money and preferably making money in the future. So there's an alignment of interest on that front, at, at least. Mm -hmm. Yes, but usually companies don't talk about strategic stuff. Governments talk about strategic stuff. Back on, uh, Barty and the UK government. Are they uh, a happily married couple with a happily with a you know happily growing child now, or are there problems coming with the diverging interests of these two? Well, most often on the day of the, of the wedding, you're pretty happy. Then the question is, how long it lasts in any couple? You know, that's that's usually the story. Uh, yeah. All right. Anyway, I mean, I think there were. If you look at the situation and being quite unique, you can also see it as the investment of opportunity, investment opportunities that Carrie has mentioned. You know, you talk about an asset where initial shareholders, Steve, has, have sunk a lot of money. Uh, the beauty of the chapter 11, you get it for less than a billion, which is still a fraction of the cost that has already been put in the asset. And so even the economics of the assets themselves, the final capex, the final capability, etc., is changed. So at the time and in a context certainly of, of Brexit and other aspect and thinking of certain aspect of running a constellation, Galileo, etc., what could be the cost opportunity of getting an asset for the UK government? Whether it was the best decision or not could be a question, but trying to have a national constellation would likely not have been possible at all. So what was the other option in case you want to do that? So I think they may have their own agenda. If you think of Barty, and I think the deal has been managed at a corporate level. So how much Barty could leverage the asset to support its, you know, certain of telecom operations in Africa, other aspects. I think all of that still has to happen as far as I understand it, which still oh, yeah. certainly is, is an opportunity. Um, but they also need potentially to welcome new shareholders because they may need additional equity or debt or funding to get the constellation complete. So they are married, but we have to see if the family shall get larger as well or whether they are happy enough to, you know, keep spending uh, additional money into it. So, all right. All right, fair enough. All right, I've got one more for all three of you, a quick one, because they're going to give us the hook otherwise. Uh, so, Pac, I'm ke keeping with you. Uh, Tell us at Leo, unlike yeah. SpaceX, billions of investors aren't dollars aren't going in there. Unlike Amazon, they don't have in-house uh, resources that have no end. And unlike the British government, they're not in there for strategic reasons. They're in there only for uh, business reasons. So uh, tell us at Leo in the next six months, does that move forward in a material way? In other words, capital is being spent on a prime contractor. Contracts are being let. The ground system is started. Material money 
goes from Talisat to Talisat Leo in the next six months? Yes or no? Uh, let's say uh, I would consider that as, as likely, and I would say on, on, on the flip side, it's next six months or never. That's also another part of the, of the answer. You know, there is a window for opportunities. They're certainly already behind the others. They're KBAN. They have a system that honestly looks pretty nice yeah. on the te technology side. So I think, as you mentioned, the agreement between shareholders is something that is pretty unique in the last few years. I'm sure they have explored quite a number of options. So the growth story for the company or the way to create additional value, maybe this one with obviously a, a number of risks. So I, I see that as you know pretty likely to happen. Uh, okay. And the company has some good fundamentals, global presence. You know, so they have a number of strengths still. Existing cash flows, all that stuff. Okay, so you agree there's a window, and windows don't remain open forever. But you think this one is still open, and they've got time to get this done before it closes so yes that could be and it's a matter of the efficiency of their constellation so to a certain extent they may almost get fully deployed and commercial where maybe you would get closer to a gen 2 of a one web or space leak if they come so their constellation have to be compatible with the global environment by yep. 20 24 5 when they would be you know up in the air all right tim tell us that it's a go or no go tell us that leo well, I mean, the, the, I would look at it in the context of the IPO proposal, uh, and it's a sort of chicken and egg. The IPO is needed to fund it, but the yeah. story is needed to get the IPO done. So we're at least going to have the story still out there and through the IPO if the IPO is going to happen. Uh, and so there's going to have to continue to be activity over the next six months. I, I, I think there is a big challenge of like, well, where are we actually building these satellites? Who's building them? what are they doing uh you know if, if there's uh no access to a factory that's busily building one web satellites in florida then where else do you go um i mean so there's a lot of questions to be answered um but there's a there's a, a there's clearly going to be a next chapter of the story at least for the next few months uh because there's no way out other than to keep it going Okay, so are they going to make material capital commitments in the next several months to signal a go well, or no? I, I think there's a lot one can do with a story uh, where you make capital <laughs> announcements uh, and the question of how committed those amounts of capital are and how contingent they are on things like successfully executing the IPO and everything yeah. else, uh, you know, remains to be seen. All right, all right. Um, Carissa. I'm probably the least optimistic uh, of, of the group here on that moving forward because Telesat makes decisions differently. They're having to make decisions on, on business fundamentals as opposed to on vision. And so I think the probability of a, of a move forward is lower, not zero, but lower. I do think if, if there is a move forward, the probability of the success of the business case is higher because that decision will be made on fundamentals. So I, I think we could see a, a backing off of that, um, uh, of that pathway by Telesat. Uh, and I do absolutely agree that uh, once we see not just the story, but the, the, the underlying business case, um, uh, we'll have much more insight in, in that underlying business case. If, if there's a move forward, we'll be, we'll be strong. Okay. I don't think- Well, I mean, I, can I just say, business. I mean, I, I think the, on the business case. I mean, the challenge for all of these players is there's only so much money being spent on satellite capacity. You know, it's like uh, if you exclude the consumer broadband space, it's maybe four or five billion dollars a year spent on you know government and uh, commercial enterprise mobility capacity uh, that's accessible to any of these players. So it's very hard to put together a business case that, that, I, that doesn't rely on either enormous growth uh, into the, what has to be a consumer space, almost certainly, or a limited number of players. So it, it's really, really challenging uh, to figure out uh, what a business case would be that would make it sensible to be the third or possibly the fourth player in, in, in this game, uh, competing with all the geos that already exist and OneWeb and SpaceX and potentially Amazon going forward. 
Yeah, I think we can probably optimism. go ahead. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. I was just going to say, hence my my less than optimistic view. Yeah, I get it. I can. Do, I think we can probably simply that will be the fourth. Um, maybe a final, maybe a, a final word on that. You know, we talked about FCC or U.S. government for uh, Starlink. We talked about the U.K. for OneWeb. It can't be the solution, but the Canadian government itself has at least a few of the keys. Also, you know how much they want to spend to communicate with the North, some territories, et cetera, or some national interest. It can't be sufficient, but again, as for the others, as a non-core tenant or helping to get started or, you know, give some of the trajectory for, for the start of operation or investment, uh, you know, we find the governments almost in every constellation game. Oh yeah, fair enough. All right, Pakom, that's the last word. We are late. Apologies to APSCC, but if you're gonna cut something in this, don't cut the constellation stuff. All right, uh, Carissa, Tim, Pakom, thanks for your time. And I'll hand back to Christopher. Thank you very much for that, Peter. And uh, thank you, Carissa. Thank you, Pakom. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, excellent insights as always and, and great, great comments. Uh, really appreciate your involvement, your feedback and your participation. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us uh, for the webinar today. Uh, if you're interested in the ongoing series, uh, we'll be producing these on a, on a more or less weekly basis, Tuesdays, at 9 a.m. is when they roll out, but they are available on demand if you, uh, if you register through APSCCSAT.com. And obviously, you've done that already because you wouldn't be watching this if you hadn't. Uh, you can see the schedule on APSCCSAT.com. That's uh, the, the website where you entered here. Uh, if you miss the, the actual playout time at 9 a.m., they are available on demand. So you, you, have, you can watch them on your own schedule as, as your, your time permits. Uh, please do look forward uh, uh, to, to future uh, installments of the webinar series. And if you're looking for the topics that are, that are coming up, uh, we'll be regularly updating the schedule on APSCCSAT.com. So please have a look there. Uh, and encourage your, your friends and colleagues to, uh, to have a look at the series and to register for themselves. Uh, and if you're interested in joining APSCC, if you're not already a member, uh, you can find more details at APSCC.OR.KR. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you uh, very soon. Cheers.